So good morning to everyone who decided to join our webinar today. I am Tomasz Wolenski. I'm a product manager with RF Elements. And we can, we can start with the webinar. We will talk about high performance wireless networks and how these networks can actually perform uh, with the stability and reliability of fiber networks. And before we go in, uh, make sure you type down your questions as they pop up in your head. Because if you're like me, um, that I would pretty much forget the question I have if I don't write it down somewhere. Uh, but because we'll be answering them at the end of the webinar, um, in your webinar tool, there is a questions field. So uh, please type them down there and we'll get to them at the end after the presentation. So at RF Elements, our, our main goal is to help WISPs thrive by helping them to run stable and fast wireless networks through our noise rejection technology with near-zero loss radio connection. And the noise rejection is a stepping stone towards massive scalability of wireless networks provided by our wide range of horn sector antennas. Fiber is often thought of as the ultimate solution to internet connectivity. Nevertheless, wireless competes with it easily, and it is absolutely within the reach of every single WISP to offer wireless connection that matches the stability and reliability of fiber networks. While the optical fiber is capable uh, of highest throughput speeds, the, the wireless is much easier to deploy. So the expenses to deploy the wireless are a fraction of any fiber network. And if the right gear is used for the wireless networks, the performance can easily match that of the fiber network. And in terms of the speed, the coaxial or DSL are on pretty much the same level as wireless. And being a WISP owner, there, there are much more factors you should consider than just the, the maximum possible throughput you can deliver. So the speed of the deployment, for example, is unmatched with wireless. And the ability to connect the new customers quickly can be actually often the winning formula in terms of competing with other WISPs. Yeah? It gives you that additional edge where you're able to react quickly. So the number one challenge in wireless networks is the RF noise, and especially in the unlicensed frequencies. So spectral graphs like these are very common, showing high levels of interference that prevents wireless networks from providing a reliable service. It might be a little better in the unlicensed frequencies, but that is only due to the financial barrier to, to get the license. Now, otherwise, it's headed in the same direction, except a little bit slower. So the poor performance of wireless networks is caused by the immense amount of poorly designed gear, namely the antennas. The radio link is not only about the radio. Its performance is just as good as the weakest link in the whole chain. And this whole chain is composed of the transmitter radio, transmitter antenna, receiver antenna, and the receiver radio. So if you have a poorly designed antenna, not even the best and the most expensive radio out there would make the wireless link work well. These are antennas that are unfortunately still used in the WISP industry. And I say unfortunately because the patch array sector as an antenna type was adopted from the cellular industry. Uh, but it is completely unsuitable for unlicensed WISP networks. And dishes, as well as the patch arrays, have properties that make them a problematic servant in unlicensed frequency bands. So the problems these antennas bring are still being addressed by, by various shields, uh, which you can see in the, in the pictures, uh, unfortunately with no 
or to very little success or a success that you might think you have, but you're very, you know, unlikely to actually point out how much better it performs because the difference is that small. One of the big issues of patch arrays are silos. Now on the right, you see the top view of a patch array that visibly radiates in every direction, causing, creating all the side lobes that radiate the signal to unintended directions, increasing the noise floor and, and slowing the network throughput down. Now on the left, you see how a horn antenna radiates. And this is how you want a wisp sector antenna to work, only to radiate the signal forward in the direction of the main lobe, nowhere else. Besides the side lobes, there are several other very important antenna performance components to a greatly performing wireless link. So first is high beam efficiency, which quantifies the side lobes. Second is the stability of the bore side gain and the rest of the radiation pattern. And thirdly, the equality of the antenna performance in both polarizations. And we'll go in detail through each of these points. So speaking of antennas having or not having side lobes, we can go from this qualitative to quantitative comparison. And beam efficiency is exactly the antenna parameter that enables it. Saying an antenna has a lot of side lobes or no side lobes is rather vague. But beam efficiency is the antenna parameter that quantifies the side lobes, meaning that we get a number. It is the ratio of energy in the main lobe to the total energy an antenna radiates. So maximum beam efficiency you can achieve is 100%, in which case the antenna literally has zero side lobes because 100% of the energy it radiates is in the main lobe. And the closer to 0% the beam efficiency gets, yeah, the lower it is, the more side lobes an antenna has. Here is a practical example. This is a radiation pattern of a generic parabolic dish antenna. So its beam efficiency is 40%. This means that the 40% of the power the antenna radiates is in the main lobe. The remaining 60% of the energy this antenna radiates goes everywhere else. And since everything outside the main lobe is a side lobe, it goes into the side lobes. And because beam efficiency includes all the side lobes of an antenna, unlike front to back ratio or any other side lobe parameter or metric you might be know, uh, it is, beam efficiency is the most complete measure of side lobes out there. WISPs use a wide portion of the spectrum, but in antenna textbooks, beam efficiency is defined at a single frequency and for single polarization. And this is the case actually for most of the textbook parameters. And it is really up to the user and mainly up to the manufacturers to, to consider whether one should care about the whole bandwidth or just a single frequency point. Since the computational power is much more affordable nowadays than it was in the past, the choice between the wideband or narrowband information about antennas is really a matter of deciding what is important rather than figure out, figuring out if we can do it at all. So in WISP industry, it makes perfect sense to average the beam efficiency over, over the whole bandwidth an antenna is working in because WISPs use their antennas in a wide frequency range. So it only makes sense that antennas should perform well in the whole bandwidth. And therefore, we extended the textbook definition of beam efficiency to a number that is the average of the beam efficiency over the whole useful bandwidth of our antennas and over both polarizations. So this turns the textbook definition into a sort of a super parameter, if you will. It is way more robust and more reliable measure of the sidelow performance than the single frequency and single polarization version or actually anything else out there. With beam efficiency, the comparison of antennas in terms of the sidelow performance is extremely simple. The higher number wins. That's all. 
So in this example, the ultra horn on the left has beam efficiency of 99%. So only 1% of the power it radiates is in the side lobes. A generic dish antenna, on the other hand, um, has beam efficiency of 40%. So the remaining 60% of the energy it radiates is in the side lobes. So clearly 99% is more than 40%, which makes ultra horn way better antenna in terms of the noise suppression. Probably, probably actually the best on the market. The vast majority of antennas used for sectorial coverage in, in the West networks are either patch arrays or horns. Now the patch arrays have many frequency dependent side lobes, so their beam efficiency values are around 60%, give or take, depending on the, the, the quality of the manufacturing and the design itself. The RF elements horns, both symmetrical and asymmetrical, have beam efficiency between 90 and 95%. So you can actually also see other horns in the graph too. And this is to highlight that it takes a considerable effort to design a horn antenna such that its beam efficiency is high. The stable and zero side low radiation pat pattern and based on that also the performance is actually not a given as soon as you have a horn. But we put a lot of effort into, into our antennas. So we achieve those high beam efficiency values of at least 90%. Similarly with the point-to-point -point antennas. The patch arrays are, again, at the bottom of the beam efficiency performance due to the many frequency-dependent side lobes collecting and transmitting the noise, hurting any and every WISP network. Dishes are somewhat better, and generally the bigger the dish, the better the beam efficiency becomes. And that is, again, if the antenna is carefully designed and well manufactured. What is interesting here is the ultra horn. Again, its beam efficiency is 99%. Just let that sink in for a second. Yeah? So it, the, the ultra horn is only 1% short from being a perfect antenna in terms of noise rejection. So over the whole bandwidth of operation in both polarizations, the beam efficiency of ultra horn is almost perfect. Only 1% of the RF signal is in the side lobes. So if you ever wondered if the ultra horn was worth the extra cash, compared to a dish antenna. You have a very clear answer here. With the 99% of beam efficiency, it's probably the best performing antenna on the market in terms of the noise suppression. To achieve stable and high performance wireless networks, use antennas with high beam efficiency. High beam efficiency equals stable and high throughput and reliable connection. Antennas with high beam efficiency ensure that the, the radio does not collect the noise from its surroundings, eliminating the, the issue of interference altogether. So no longer will the link be at the mercy of the surrounding noise sources. Its noise immunity improves, and therefore also the stability and reliability of the connection you're eventually providing. Second component of the stable and great performing wireless network is the frequency stability of antenna parameters. The gain of the traditional patch array sector is, is changing with frequency, as seen from this graph on the left. At the start of the 5 GHz spectrum, it is very low gain, and then goes to some nominal value, and eventually goes down again at the end of the spectrum. Now this gain characteristic is far from the ideal, which is illustrated by the green dotted line, where by the ideal, we mean that the gain would not change with frequency. So that's why it, the, the ideal scenario is uh, illustrated by the flat dotted line at the, at the top. The same goes for the rest of the radiation pattern. With the patch arrays, it, it changes with frequency a lot. So the many side lobes these antennas have create and collect the RF noise. Now on top of that, the main lobe is also changing with frequency. And this results into fluctuating coverage of a sector, which at your end results into unstable coverage and noise floor of, 
of what the radio sees with uh, with changing the channel. So as you're changing the channel on your radio, hoping to leverage that cleaner bit of the spectrum you might be seeing on the spectrograph, um, you're you're always up for a unpleasant surprise when using the traditional patch array sectors exactly because of their frequency instability. Symmetrical horn antennas are quite different. Now you see that the boresight gain is near ideal, which really sets the horn sectors apart from the traditional antennas. Changing the channel makes virtually no difference whatsoever to the signal levels you see when using a horn sector. Same goes for the rest of the radiation pattern of horns. So the frequency stability of horn radiation is unmatched. You can see it changing a little bit with the frequency, but the resulting change of the coverage area is, is almost non-existent. This is another bit adding to the overall stability of a wireless network as a whole. And so use antennas with a little to, to no frequency dependence of the radiation pattern. Horns are, are the most stable ones regarding this criterion from all the antennas you, you, know, you have at your disposal. The third bit into the puzzle uh, is the equality of the radiation patterns when switching between the polarizations. Highlighted by, by the red solid color, you, you see the mismatch between the polarizations of a traditional patch array antenna. Now this mismatch results into, into similar effect on the network performance as, as the gain instability. When switching between the polarizations, the signal strength changes in an unpredictable way. Now, horns do beat the odds here as well. And actually, it's not the odds, but the physics of the horn antennas that make it possible for the polarizations to be exactly the same, which is what you can see here on this slide. There is only one line in the graph, which might be a little confusing, but it's because the horizontal and vertical curves are completely overlapping. Now, this is an ideal situation because both polarizations have exactly the same performance. So switching between them makes absolutely no difference to the network performance, making the connection stable and reliable. With, with the asymmetrical horns, uh, the story is similar. No difference between the polarizations equals stable and reliable wireless network. Also, the ultra horn. If you wondered, again, no difference whatsoever between the polarizations. So the point-to-point -point link performs uh, with an amazing stability and reliability. So much so that you can actually run your key backhaul links in the 5 gigahertz spectrum despite all the issues with noise that are common when using other antennas. Ultrahorn is probably the best performing antenna in terms of noise rejection because of its 99% beam efficiency, which really protects your network from vast majority of the noise. And by now, you may be wondering how to apply the knowledge you just acquired in practice, which is what, uh, what we will show you in the next few slides. So again, beware of antennas with strong side loads. That's the first and, and very important point. These are uh, the traditional patch arrays, which were the first type of sector antennas used in the WISP industry. And in areas with a dense population and dense collocation of the customers and competing WISPs, you should absolutely try to avoid using the patch array sectors if you can. And here is how, how it looks. The side lobes uh, and the wide radiation pattern cause deterioration of wireless network with, uh, with every new customer connected. So has the problem uh, with side lobes causing instability of wireless network multiplies with, with growing number of sectors? 
the side lobes of the neighboring sectors interact with each other. And despite all devices on a tower, maybe even your own, yeah, not even counting in the potential competitor WISP, the interference problems keep growing until you hit that limit where adding even one more sector or one more customer, connecting, connecting one more customer can make the whole network dysfunctional. And of course, all the way, it's very unstable and, and really at the mercy of, of the surroundings. The dish antennas, which are uh, used mostly for point-to-point -point applications, also have many side lobes. So the physics of these antennas dictate you, you cannot fully avoid the side lobes altogether. The result of a dish having side lobes is principally the same as with the patch arrays. The side lobes collect and transmit the interference from unwanted directions, eventually showing up as a slow network, sort of leaving you, you know, maybe leaving you scratching your head and wondering, well, where is my promised one gigabit of the throughput the radio manufacturer promised? So the backhaul links suffer from the side lobes all the same. Regardless if you use dish antenna or directional patch array, the side lobes these antennas have will inevitably lead to consistent degradation of wireless network throughput and even more so if, if you also have competitors using the same antennas. So using antennas without the side lobes and the beam width fitting to the scenario is the way to stabilize the wireless network. Because if you do not collect the noise, you, do not, you don't have to deal with it in the first place. And if you, if you only cover the area necessary, you're really doing the best thing you can for your customers and yourself at the same time. If you replace even just one patch array sector by a horn or, or a pair of horns, depending on the width of the sector you're replacing, um, you know, or just to sort of ease into the RF elements technology, because of course, well, trying something new, you want to be careful. You will see a significant change in performance, nevertheless. So not only the horn sectors will perform very well, but also the remaining patch array sectors will improve. And this is sort of counterintuitive and sometimes confusing thing about horns. They provide better performance precisely because of the lack of something, which in this case are the side lobes. But you can go even further. So the biggest gains and the, the, the maximum stabilization you can introduce to your network um, is visible when, when all patch array sectors are replaced with horn sectors. Now you removed all the sources of noise on a tower and each sector can function very near the maximum throughput the radio can handle, regardless which one you use actually. So stop, you know, you can go from, you know, worrying every day and praying that, you know, the, the network doesn't crash and hoping you can still maybe connect this one more person. You can really go to, wow, little to no noise and great stability, great reliability, and I can keep adding customers, no problem whatsoever. It is really possible with the horn sectors. Replacing a dish antenna with a highly directional horn in high noise areas, the overall throughput will increase and you'll introduce way more stability to the network, as I mentioned before so much stability that you can actually run your backhauls on in the 5 gigahertz spectrum. So horn-based point-to-point links are very stable. This is how horns work, unlike the traditional directional patch array sectors or dishes. But the real magic happens when, when you use only horns. So no side lobes means no noise and that equals to maximum performance of your network. Sometimes uh, WISPs who start using our horns and may be very happy with them, they kind of like to keep it to themselves yeah, and do not tell anyone um, that they, they, they managed to improve their network to kind of keep the advantage over the competitors, maybe. But in fact, if, if your competitors started using horns as well, it would be good for you too. The less noise everyone generates, the better for everyone. 
And if you wondered, well, but these horns have like really, really narrow radiation patterns if I should stay at least on the similar level of gain I'm having with the patch array sectors. Well, of course, you need to segment the or, or split the those original patch array sectors to, to narrower horn sectors. Yeah. And if you wonder how densely horns can be installed and still deliver on their promise, you see a clear answer here. Many. Lots of sectors coexisting on one tower and with excellent and stable performance at the same time. Unbelievable, right? With horns, this is daily reality. And these are pictures from our customers, actually, not our own. So um, be rest assured that we, we didn't manufacture this. They are not the product of, of, of a skillful Photoshop graphics person. These are photos from our customers. And horns are, you know, should be looked at as a tool set that allows you to respond and adjust your network to any situation in an optimal way. Now on the on these images you can see uh, six ultra horns yeah, covering distant narrow sector with, with the 15 degrees beam width and each of them covering one sector. In the middle is a is a cluster of different horns. The versatility of scenarios you're able to cover with horns is unmatched by any other antenna technology in the WISP industry. So to give you a, a short summary, so the three rules of, of uh, successfully stabilizing and helping your wireless networks perform with the stability and reliability of fiber network are, so the first, use antennas with high beam efficiency. The higher the beam efficiency, the less side lobes equals lower noise floor, the radio cease, and eventually higher network throughput. Second, second rule is to, to use uh, antennas which, which are very stable with changing frequency. So the traditional sectors and their properties, namely the gain and radiation pattern, are, are fluctuating with frequency a lot, as we've seen from the previous slides. But with horns, this is not the case. They're extremely stable, meaning that they stabilize the performance of your wireless network as well. And the third rule is to use antennas with equal performance uh, on both polarizations. So switching to polarizations, again, might be introducing undesired instability, unreliability, and eventually headache for you and for your customers. With horns, the performance of the horizontal and vertical polarizations is identical, meaning that the switching between them makes absolutely no difference to the performance of the whole network. So altogether, horns introduce um, the stability the the wisps uh, are really looking for you know and maybe unfortunately because of the chronological or the way the patch array sectors were adopted first into the wisp industry has caused a lot of um a lot of resentment maybe against the free uh free spectra the unlicensed spectra but that's again as i as i mentioned at the beginning the wireless link is a chain yeah you have to consider the whole chain and each link in the chain uh, makes difference to the performance of the whole network. So when using horns you 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 get to the stability and reliability of the wireless network which it should have had since the beginning. Sometimes our customers are are not quite sure where to buy our products. So if you go to our webpage rfelements.com and on the top menu, you, you see a stock locator. So clicking that, it will take you to a page where you can, you can find the distributors that are nearest to you, such as, for example, Myro Distribution. And I would also like to invite you to join our online community. rfelab.com is our discussion forum, uh, which is a forum as any other. You can, you can ask us any question regarding our products. We also announce the events we're, we're attending. 
there and we also post the recordings of webinars such as this one and so on and on of course you can also search through the questions that were already asked if you're if you're not sure about anything Our YouTube channel has a playlist called Wisp Traveler, and there uh, we, we traveled around the world and interviewed Wisps like yourselves uh, about our antennas and what is their experience uh, with our antennas and how they help them improve their, their networks. Another playlist we have on YouTube is called Inside Wireless, and that's a it's a series of short, punchy, around three minutes videos about all kinds of things from the world of RF engineering. So whether you're an unexperienced WISP, a veteran RF engineer, or, or maybe you're just starting your WISP, um, either way, you know, refreshing your knowledge or uh, getting better understanding of the RF concepts is always useful uh, when running a WISP, ne WISP network. And we have a presence on most of the major social media. So if you follow us there, uh, Facebook is probably the most prominent where we are the most active, uh, but we're, we're also on Instagram, um, YouTube and LinkedIn, if that's your preferred channel. All right, well, uh, the, the webinar is over. Thank you for, for attending and we'll we'll send you the the link to the recording as soon as we have it and have a have a nice rest of the day <laughs>